President Obama recently gave a speech on the state of the economy. And today we have an economist with us who's one of the premier authors and economists in our nation. So we're excited to talk with him today, Professor John Lott. And John, can you please tell us about your background? You've taught at so many universities here. Right, well I have a PhD in economics, but I've taught at UCLA, the Wharton Business School, uh, University of Chicago Law School, I was at Yale Law School for a couple of years. So, and uh, now you're based in Washington, D.C.? Right. So. so what brought you all the way to Hawaii? Uh, I was asked to give a couple talks at the University of Hawaii Law School. So I gave a talk on uh, this last Tuesday, and then uh, on Thursday I gave a talk to the faculty at the law school. So we hear all different media reports. We hear the president, we hear Congress battling over the budget. What do you think is the state of our, our nation right now, economically speaking? Well, I think we're in a period of fairly slow growth. I mean, I don't uh, see us slipping back into another recession, but I think if you look at most recoveries, this has been, if it's set to any record, it's been a record slow recovery. Uh, you know, we're still, we've had growth rate that's maybe about 40% of what you would expect uh, for this type of recovery. And uh, the job growth is, we haven't seen this bad of job growth. I mean, the jobs uh, that we've had created have pretty much for the first time ever been just temporary service sector jobs. Uh, you can get t normally temporary service sector jobs in the, in the recession, but uh, employers are just apparently afraid to go and hire people long term to give them permanent jobs. There's a lot of uncertainty that they have and they don't want to lock themselves into longer term jobs. If you just look at, if you take out temporary jobs that have been created, since the recovery started in June 2009, we have about 600,000 fewer permanent jobs in the economy. And as I said, there's no time that we've seen similar to that. So what do you think about this whole stimulus thing? We had this big stimulus and then the president wanted to have another stimulus uh, reissued. So that, did, did that work? All right. Well, we've had obviously the big stimulus of $828 billion, but we've had all these jobs bills, which one would think would normally have been called more stimulus because they were the same thing that the first one had. It's just, I guess at some point, the PR people decided that the stimulus had somehow gotten a bad name, and so they, did, they wanted to call it something else. So, I mean, altogether, we're talking about well over a trillion dollars. Uh, I think it's what's helped cause higher unemployment uh, rather than fixing it. Uh, you know, the notion is, is that the government's taken money from where you and I would have spent it to where the government wants it spent. And when you move the, around the money like that, you move around the jobs that are associated with that money, and people don't instantly move from one job to another. It takes them a while to figure out where the new job is. And, uh, uh, you know, in many cases, people will find there are no new jobs even remotely similar to the old jobs that they had had. You know, you work in the oil industry, you know, maybe so there's new jobs in solar energy. It may not be a set of skills that you're particularly well qualified for, and the drop in your income may be so big that it just takes a long time for these people to kind of reconcile themselves to the fact that they can't get their old jobs back. But it's that type of chaos that you have in the economy. And it's just not the stimulus moving around money. We've had massive new regulations. We've had the Environmental Protection Agency seems to be regularly issuing new rules. Uh, we've had many pieces of regulatory legislation been passed. Uh, you know, financial regulations that were passed last year, healthcare regulations, uh, financial regulations. Uh, uh, whole sectors of the economy are being re-regulated and for healthcare we have 158 new regulatory bodies that are being set up. Many of these things we don't even know yet what the final regulations are going to be, not even close. They haven't even set up the regulatory bodies yet. But they're winners and losers. They're companies that think they're going to win as a result of this and companies who think they're going to lose. And that moves jobs around too. And it does, jobs don't move instantly in that case either. Well, I know in Hawaii, we've only spent about half of their stimulus money so far. And the Stimulus Commission has to make a report to the legislature after the legislature's over this year. But um, have, you, have you noticed where the money just, uh, the stimulus money just isn't getting spent? Um, well, is sure it getting put out there or do you see problems with where it's getting spent? Well, I, I mean, the problem is it's created this chaos mm -hmm. in the economy. It's moved around things. And it's, you know, there are other things that they've done that have moved around the money too, as we're saying. That's just part of the story. But, uh, 
you know, there's, when the president talks about investments, the one thing he's not really getting across, I think, is that uh, there's a reason why companies weren't making those investments to begin with, that the costs for those things were greater than the benefits. And, uh, and so my concern about that is just I think it makes the country poorer when you go and invest in things where people wouldn't put their own money into them, uh, you know, whether it be high-speed rail or, or other things. I mean, uh, companies can build railroads if it paid for them to do that. Uh, the fact that they're not should make them think twice about whether the traffic there is going to be able to repay the investment. If it's not, then we're poor. So I think there are two things. One, we're poor just as you create this temporary unemployment by moving jobs around. People aren't producing for some period of time. But also the types of investments. I think you know, there's real concerns about those things. And, and when the subsidies end, you know, I assume at some point, even though the president's continuing a lot of the subsidies past what the original stimulus was and his new budget that he's just put out, uh, at some point those subsidies are going to end. And in many of the places, it's not going to be profitable despite the huge amount of money that's been put in to continue them. So we've moved jobs into some areas, and then those jobs are presumably going to move back to someplace else at a future date. And so it's just kind of continuing the chaos that's there. So one of the big issues in Hawaii is rail, because uh -huh. we're just about to uh, embark on building, constructing a rail, a $5.5 billion rail. Wow. And Fox News was just covering that California's 5.5 billion rail, but of course we're a much smaller island, much smaller place, location, a much smaller population. So that's a real controversy here where the population is pretty divided evenly on whether or not we should have a rail. And, so a lot uh, of things you can do with five and a half billion dollars. Right, especially here with a lot of problems with, um, with the infrastructure. We've hotly debated that issue on, our, on, our show, on, my, on this show before. But, um, so, but all across the country, there's a debate about rail, right? right. And in and, and this budget coming up, because the president, as you mentioned, is pushing so it's like for $63 rail. $63 billion dollars more that he wants to spend on rail, so on top of what was already in the stimulus. Right, and, only, and according to his budget, I guess only $250 million is coming to Hawaii, if it even gets there. But right. there's going to be a battle between what he proposes and what the Congress chooses, right? Oh, well, sure. Uh, the Democrats still control the Senate. The Republicans control the House. Obviously, I don't think they're all going to agree. But, you know, one thing just to look at rail, I mean, mm -hmm. you look at uh, local rail across the country. Washington, D.C. is often pointed to as kind of an ideal public transit system with the rail. But they cover like a third of their variable costs, you know, just the operating costs, let alone trying to get back all the fixed investments that were there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you can't even get back, a, just even cover, so you have like an operating deficit. Mm -hmm. And so someplace like Hawaii is going to have to say, we get this five and a half billion dollars, we build the rail, but we're going to have to be subsidizing this thing for years on into the future because we're not going to be covering our operating costs. And, uh, and so Hawaii has to make a decision whether all that money that they're going to have to be committing in these future years could have been used for something else. So a lot of times the debate is, well, okay, with the rail advocates is, okay, we, we want to build this rail because, you know, we need to alleviate traffic. That's one thing. But then the, uh, you know, some of the engineering people have pointed out, well, you're really not going to alleviate that much traffic. It's not really, it's going to be very, very minimal. Um, and then they say, okay, well, we want to create jobs. Okay. And so then the debate is, does the so building the rail build, really create jobs? Well, the money comes from someplace. Now, maybe Hawaii is getting more money that's being taken away from some other state or some other place. But, uh, you know, whether you tax or you borrow or you inflate, you're essentially moving money from, and resources from one place to another. And, uh, and so the question you really have to ask is whether this investment makes sense, not whether it's going to be creating jobs. In fact, as I say, in the short run, when you're moving those resources around, you create unemployment. You know, people aren't going to move instantly from the jobs that they currently have. And, uh, uh, you know, if the investment, it costs more than you're going to get, then you just make yourself poorer as a country to go and spend it on things like that. Uh, there, you know, if you want to, you could lower taxes and, you know, give companies an incentive to go and hire more people but as they expand. So it's not just, um, you know, it's just not this one area. Mm -hmm. And I... 
And I really haven't heard a lot of discussion about why these investments are particularly smart investments for the government to be making. And, you know, I don't, you look originally, a lot of the, most of the railroads in the U.S. were built privately, almost all of them. The New, York, the New York subway system was built privately. Nobody had to go and pay for those things to be done. I mean, we had a brief period after the Civil War around there where railroads got some subsidies. But for the vast majority of time, there was no subsidies. Uh, you know, if it paid for them to do it, they did. And they got built. And so the question is now, why are we in a situation where the government has to spend huge, massive amounts of money? I mean, so we have $63 billion in this budget uh, spent on high-speed rail. We've had a $1.4 trillion deficit the first year of the Obama administration. We had $1.3 trillion the second year. And now the latest numbers that have just come out this week indicate we're likely to have a $1.6 trillion deficit this year. I mean, these are huge, massive deficits. If you look at the 10-year uh, federal government planning, uh, budget planning under the Obama administration, the amount of debt that's being increased is equal to, just the increase in government spending, is equal to about $130,000 for a family of four. And so you have to ask yourself, we already had a lot of government before Obama came in there, and is the increase in government worth, a, you know, would you be willing to pay $130,000 for that? We're not talking about getting rid of the government, but just is the increase worth it? Or would you rather have the $130 to spend on schooling, to spend on a house, to buy a new car, to buy other things that are there? And my guess is if most people were asked that question, they'd say they could find a lot better uses for that $130,000 for their family in their own lives than they're getting from these additional services from the government. So how do you think we got to this point where government is just taking, has so much control, it's got so much money, uh, just takes more and more money. Um, here I know people kind of feel apathetic and even helpless because it's, it's first they felt ap helpless and I think then came the apathy because they, they just don't feel like they can participate in the government, the government's not listening, but then there's really no change in the election. So why do you think it, it's gotten to this point where people feel I mean, we've, we've seen the tea parties across the country. We did see the last election revolution, but why do you think the government's gotten to this point where it's just such a big blob, basically, controlling so, well, so much? a lot of people who gain from these government spending. You know, you have companies that get a lot of money from the government contracts. So, you know, some other company loses money that you and I would have spent, but then somebody else gets the money that the government takes there and gives it to them. So General Electric, other companies have gotten great deals as a result of this. Uh, a lot of unions have benefited from this. The stimulus dollars that have been spent have required that you have to have union labor to go do the different things. So, you know, some people have gained as a result of this. Some people have gained a lot. There have been a lot of public uh, sector jobs that have gained a huge amount. The federal government's grown significantly over the last couple of years. Washington, D.C. is the one place in the country over the last few years that's had consistent increases in, in personal income. Uh, you know, plus the border counties in Northern Virginia and Maryland there. Uh, so, um, you know, there are groups that benefit from these spending and there's other people that are going to get hurt as a result of that. I think the sad thing is, though, to the extent that these really aren't smart investments that we'll be doing just because we're doing them because they make political sense, that on net the people who lose are going to lose more than the people who gain gain. So who are the people that, you went over some of the people that win, but who are some of the people that lose, do you think? The, well, everybody else on average. The I mean, average they, taxpayer. Right. The average taxpayer is going to lose, but lots of companies are going to lose. Uh, you know, you, you can look at industries which are being hurt by a lot of these new regulations. Uh, you know, you see like Goldman Sachs lobbied very strongly in favor of the new financial market regulations because uh, banks were prevented from doing certain activities that they're going to be allowed to do. Uh, and so if we can eliminate competitors from there, you know, that's great from their perspective. The people who can't do the jobs now, you know, they're not too thrilled about it. But, um, uh, but you know, you see this in lots of different ways. So, um, you know, so what do you think is going to happen with the whole health care issue? You brought up health care before as one of the industries that have had big changes. What do you think is going to happen in terms of how that's going to the Obamacare bill is going to impact right. the economy, or do you think it's even going to get implemented? Well, those with are all political the decisions. Those are 
you know, I, mean, I can make guesses, mm -hmm. but uh, you probably can get experts on the Supreme Court that mm -hmm. can make at least better judgments than I can on that. Uh, look, the original motivations for Obamacare was that it was going to solve the financial crisis for the for federal government and was also going to lower the cost for businesses. Uh, it seems pretty clear on both counts that that's not going to happen. Uh, with regard to businesses, they're required by law when there's significant regulatory changes is to write off the cost or to say we expect our cost to fall as a result of that. And you have had thousands of companies that have filed their SEC forms that are there. And I haven't heard of a company yet who said that its costs are going to fall as a result of Obamacare. You know, some of them may only increase by, you know, a few hundred million dollars or 10 millions if it's a small company, but you have others whose costs are going to be increasing by billions of dollars. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's pretty obvious in that case. And uh, with regard to the federal government, you have the actuaries for Medicare and Medicaid who have come out. I mean, these are people working in the Obama administration now who have talked about hundreds of billions of dollars of increase in costs over the next decade. And it looks like even worse after that. So, you know, it's, uh, the Obama administration can say that they disagree with their own actuaries that are there, uh, say that they've made mistakes, but I think... Uh, you know, it's, I think it's telling when even Obama appointees are coming out and saying that the administration's been wrong on, on a lot of these things. So, and I guess it's not really too surprising to me. I mean, you go and you mandate lots of new things that insurance companies have to provide. Uh, you say, we're going to get rid of caps on what total payments are going to be. So maybe under your old insurance policy, you would have had a lifetime cap of $3 million or $5 million. Now there's no limit on that. Uh, we get, we're limiting co-pays and the sizes of those things can be. Well, there's a reason why you have co-pays. One is it at least makes the patients a little bit more sensitive to what medical care they get. So if, if government, somebody pays for 100%, then they say, fine, I get everything. And, but at least if they pay 5% or whatever it is, they at least take into account, do I really need this surgery? Is it something that's really that helpful for me? So at least to think about it a little bit. But the problem is then you're going to increase demand uh, for these things. You know, uh, in the past, you've had a choice. You could buy insurance that had smaller deductibles, but you paid more for it. Now you don't have that choice. And uh, when you get rid of that choice, uh, it means you're going to be paying more for health care, more for your insurance than you did previously. So you have health insurance policies from across the country having increased premiums as a result of the changes that were there. And uh, so I don't know, maybe it's some big conspiracy where the Obama administration actuaries, the insurance companies, and all the companies across the country are all involved in saying these are increasing costs, but uh, you have a bit too many people involved in a conspiracy. I think it's pretty clear that, that the Obama reforms uh, have made things much more costly than they would have been otherwise. And Unfortunately, at the same time, making it more costly is going to give people less of what they wanted. Well, people here in Hawaii are very confused about the Obama lobby, Obamacare law because we've been told by one of our congresswomen, Maisie Hirono, that we get an exemption, but then we're not sure what does that even mean and how much of what is exempted and what's not. So there's still a lot of confusion here about that. And also, Hawaii has already been, we have the Prepaid Health Care Act. And so we already, as employers, are mandated that we pay for the health insurance of anyone who works over 20 hours or more anyway. But um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see Hawaii is one of those uh, states where um, people are even more confused than other states, I think. Right. Well, join the club. Join I don't, the club, I don't right? know. <laughs> Hawaii is more or less confused. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is one of the problems that you have. I and mean, we m mentioned all these regulatory bureaus that are going to be set up and all the new rules. Some people are going to be exempted. There's a large number of unions that have been exempted from uh, parts of the uh, Obamacare just for the next year. You know, are they going to be exempted after that? You know, what happens when you have a change in administrations or something? Uh, but, you know, it's kind of ironic. These were often the same groups that were lobbying for the bills to begin with, and now they want to be exempted from parts of it. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a pretty arbitrary system, and until we have all the regulations in place, I mean, who knows what's going to happen with it. But uh, I think 
the confusion affects hospitals planning, it affects doctors, it affects the types of investments that they're going to be making. You know, you look at some of the effects already that we're seeing. Uh, look at pharmaceuticals. In 15, 16 years ago, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States was the envy of the world. We were producing one new drug after, miracle drug after another. Uh, the Obama administration says now the pharmaceutical companies have lost the will to innovate, to quote them. And, uh, you know, that somehow they just don't care about producing new drugs. Well, I don't find that particularly surprising when they've been hammered for supposedly making so much money in profits. You know, it's the fact that you can make profits have driven them to go and innovate and create new things. And since the Clinton administration, we've had talks and threats of price controls being there. So let's say you had had uh, some bright young scientist come into your office, your president of Merck or Pfizer and he had some new drug that was going to help reduce heart disease. And he was telling you about it and seemed convincing, but as CEO, you'd have to make a decision saying, well, if we invest in this, be a billion dollars, may take 10 years before this product comes to market. Well, you have to take into account there's some chance that price controls would be imposed. And if they got imposed, let's say five or six or seven years down the road before the drug came out, you wouldn't be able to recoup the big fixed investments that you had made. And so you tell the guy, look, it sounds like a great drug. Hopefully somebody will end up making it one of these days. But we can't go and spend this billion dollars to go and develop it and have it so that we're not going to be able to charge money to recoup it at the end. And, uh, you know, so the president's response, though, rather than trying to reverse course and say, you know, all of his attacks on these profits have been, you know, may have caused this problem, his response has been to get the federal government involved now in actually developing and marketing drugs itself that's going to compete with the pharmaceuticals. So it's not really save money. We've reduced the profits for the pharmaceutical companies, and now we're going to take a lot of that money and spend it now on the government developing drugs. Uh, and so the ultimate question you have is, do you think the government's going to be more efficient at doing the job that the private companies were going to do? My guess is it's pretty hard to believe that the federal government's going to be a lot more effective, that they're going to get more drugs produced per dollar spent. I know the president during the health care debate would often talk about the fact that he said, well, private companies are at a disadvantage relative to government because private companies have to tack on profits above their costs, and so government can do it at a lower cost. You know, um, profits give you an incentive to lower costs, and they give you an incentive to improve quality. And uh, if profits really just added extra to cost, you would think all of our businesses would be nonprofit in this country. The, federal, the, the tax system gives huge subsidies to nonprofit organizations. So they're, they're an advantage. But yet, you don't see cars being made by nonprofits. You don't see computers being made by nonprofits. You don't see software being written by nonprofits. There's a reason for that, is that despite having these Profits also, it's the profits that concentrate their efforts to be able to go and make these products at a lower cost and better quality. If they didn't, they lose business to somebody else and they lose those profits that they could have gotten. And um, I think the problem is, is that we're going to get be spending just as much. It's just not going to be the drug companies that are going to have it. The government's going to be spending it. And we're going to get a lot less for each dollar. So what about some of the other big issues in the, uh, that the federal government's wrestling with right now, or even the state governments across the country? For example, pension reform. Have you been, public pension reform, have you been following that? And the whole tax issue, should public pensions be taxed? That's a big thing right now in Hawaii, big debate going on, where our governor wants to uh, tax the public pensions and the public un unions are in uh, uproar. All right. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's other people know more about the pension issues than I do, but... Uh... You know, apparently what's happened for a period of time is you've made deals with unions where rather than uh, kind of explicitly raising their wages, we've given them more benefits. And, um, you know, there's no private company basically anymore that goes and gives defined benefits. Everybody gives defined contributions that are there. And there's a reason for that. But uh, the public sector, you know, hasn't faced the same types of costs or incentives that private companies have to deal with all the time. And so they promised uh, these well-defined benefits that are there, and they've been giving them larger, much larger pensions than you could possibly hope to get in the private sector. 
And, you know, it's not too surprising. We put off the costs. You know, politicians for a long time said, well, we'll let somebody deal with that a couple of decades down the road. And, you know, it's a bill that's starting to come due. You know, the problem is it's just not the states that are running into this problem now, but Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are going to be running into big deficits. You know, maybe the, if the Supreme Court doesn't strike down the health care bill, we're going to be having, uh, you know, in the next decade, huge increases in costs from that. And so it's not clear that the federal government's going to have money to go and bail anybody out, no matter how bad a shape they're going to be in. So real quick, because we're, running, we're uh, going to wrap up the show real quick, but I wanted to ask you, what do you see in the future for America? What do you see coming up? Well, we're kind know. of at a turning point, right? Right. Well, I mean, I think there's lots of things that we can do. Uh, you know, the United States has by far the corporate, highest corporate income tax right in the world. We also have, in many ways, the highest regulatory burden. Those things are additive. When somebody's making a decision whether or not to go and invest in the United States or Canada, they say in the United States is a corporate income tax rate of 40%. In Canada, it's 16%. 24 percentage points just by itself, even ignoring the regulatory burdens, is a pretty big difference. Uh, you know, Ireland, you can invest there for get 12% tax. And so, you know, we have to understand we're in a world capital market. And even just being slightly more attractive than other countries can cause a huge inflow of investments here. And so if we, you know, if people invest in Canada, uh, their wages go up because there's more people trying to hire the people that are there. Fewer people trying to hire people here, our wages aren't going to go up as much as they would have otherwise. And, and so there are things that we can do. I just hope we do them. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, the current administration's moving in that direction. Okay, tell me real quick, what's the name of your book? Well, I have money books, but one of them is Freedomnomics, dealing with economics-type issues. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. I can't believe we need a whole hour to cover all these issues, but thank you to, for joining us today. And um, it's been a great a half hour with John Lott. We look forward to more conversations with him in the future. I'm Aliyah Zimmerman. This is News Behind the News. Aloha.